Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the EGUG Birds of a Feather webinar series. My name is Joe Johnson, and I'm with Esri here in Redlands, California. Today's webinar will feature Joseph Tillman and Scott Howard, both from Colquitt EMC. Their discussion will show how they recovered from severe system damage and outages after Hurricane Hermine in 2016. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. On this slide, you'll see there are different options you have during the webinar. You can change how you connect to, how you connect to the audio or adjust your view. Also keep in mind, you can ask questions during the webinar using the question dialog box and hitting the send button. Remember, there will be time for questions and answers towards the end of the webinar. I would like to say today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email in approximately one week uh, to watch the recording. Uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our EGUG president, uh, Jessica Vieira Atwell. Uh, welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar. Uh, just a few reminders, GeoConnect 2017 is fast approaching. Uh, there's still time to register to attend GeoConnect in Chicago. The official GeoConnect schedule is out and available on the Esri Events webpage as of today. And you can access that at www.esri.com slash events slash GeoConnect. Uh, we will kick off things on Tuesday, September the 5th with our welcome reception from 6 to 8. The Birds of a Feather group meetings are on Wednesday following the plenary and the hosted lunch. Uh, the EGUG community meeting is on Thursday at 1.15. We'll last about an hour until about 2.15 in the afternoon. And then we'll follow that up with our evening social where we will have the chance to watch the White Sox take on the Cleveland Indians at U.S. Cellular Field. Uh, there will be transportation provided to and from the hotel to the event, so you don't have to worry about any sort of transportation on your end. And Friday's <clears throat> closing session will begin at 11.45, and GeoConnect will officially close out this year at 1 p.m. Uh, and again, there's still time to register you can see the official schedule, including presentation times uh, and tech sessions, et cetera, available on the Esri Events website. And with that, let's move on to today's webinar. We are right in the middle of hurricane season, and those of us that live on the eastern seaboard, Gulf Coast, are well aware of how destructive these storms can be. And today we have Joseph Tillman, who is the Director of Information Technology, and Scott Howard, the Mapping, Dispatch, and Plan Accountant Supervisor for Colquitt EMC in Georgia. And they're gonna tell us how their GIS and OMS work together to help their utility during post-restoration or post-hurricane restoration work. And with that, Joseph and Scott, I will hand things over to you all. All right, thanks, Jessica. Um, before I go into the slideshow, I'm gonna just kind of give you some background on Colquitt, our size. Um, we have 43,000 members with Colquitt EMC, uh, approximately 65,000 electric meters out in the field. And our territory covers seven, seven counties here in South Georgia. Um, we have six offices that are all connected uh, through a leased fiber line through our ISP. Um, we use Dell file servers and our OMS database is stored on a Dell SAN, uh, our network at our main office in Moultrie, Georgia. Um, okay, going right into it, into the, this slide here is just a still shot showing the path that uh, Hermine took. You can see um, down in South Georgia, that's right at our coverage territory. So um, all seven of our counties were affected by this hurricane. Uh, really, it, we got our first outage calls on August 28th, but the blunt of this storm really came on September the 2nd. Between August 28th and September the 4th, we received over 25,000 phone calls to our dispatch center. And in that dispatch center, our normal daytime staff consists of two dispatchers, and then at night we cut back to one dispatcher to handle after our phone calls and outage reports, things like that. 
Uh, I've got us some slides here with some statistics of the calls that we received during the storm. So on September the 2nd, we got almost 20,000 phone calls to our dispatch center. Um, average call was a little over a minute and a half. Comes out to about 832 calls an hour, 14 calls a minute, which is 724 hours of talk time. Uh, estimated it would take 98 hour shifts just to answer the phone call. So a ton of phone calls on that one day, we would have to have uh, fully staffed dispatchers doing nothing but talking on the phone. To return those calls, it would have taken uh, almost 63 eight hour shifts just returning consumer phone calls, reporting outages. Well, before I go to that slide, the important thing here about the um, these statistics of our calls is that obviously there's no practical way to make this work, answering these phone calls or returning these phone calls. So we have an IDR system that takes these phone calls and it communicates directly with our OMS system. So consumer calls to report an outage, they get our automated IVR, they leave their phone number or account number. Our OMS system is able to pull their data from our CIS system, create an outage in OMS without a dispatcher ever having to verbally talk to a consumer. So they call in and the outage shows up in our OMS system. And that obviously was very useful for you know over 20,000 calls and outages reported. So thinking back to the good old days, well before my time, um, Cockwood EMC has been around since 1936. So even up until the last few years, there were no IVR, no OMS, uh, no maps. And really without that, the storm that we had last year, there would have been no chance that we could have met our members' expectations on working those outages or even communicating with all of the consumers who were calling in uh, to report their outages. So some highlights for OMS for us, the integration with multiple platforms. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Future has been able to integrate with our CIS software, our IVR software, our automatic metering software, as well as an AVL system that keeps tracks of our trucks out in the field. We can see where they're at on a map. Um, as I said before, we got the 20,000 phone calls and we actually had 35,000 outages reported just through our automatic metering system. So meter out in the field loses communication. It sends a last breath signal back saying, I'm out. Our OMS system gets that signal and an outage is reported. So if that consumer then calls in to our IVR system, our OMS system sees, hey, an, an outage has already been reported for that location. I'm just going to group, you know, add that call to this outage instead of creating redundant outages. So that has been extremely nice and makes things very efficient for working these outages. Uh, another thing to note is with all of the calls and data that was being sent to our OMS system during that storm, uh, our system resource utilization never went above 5%. Uh, well, I won't say never, it, it occasionally went between 5 and 11%, but very rarely did it go over 5%, which was, from a technical standpoint, pretty impressive to us. Uh, next thing is ease of use. Uh, during that storm, we brought in some extra dis dispatchers to keep in contact with the crew and dispatch them out to different outages. Um, some of these dispatchers may not have ever used OMS or may not been, have been experienced with OMS. So Futura actually conducted a 30 minute uh, class, so to speak, there in our office online. And within that 30 minutes, these dispatchers were able to learn how to use OMS well enough to uh, be able to work these outages and increase out to work these outages. And then finally, I uh, have to say something about the service and support. They provided 24-7 support with us. Um, as far as they were logged into our servers, monitoring resources, and uh, making sure that everything was working as it was supposed to. They were always available if we needed to contact them. And like I said, the training that they provided was excellent. At this point, I'm going to transfer it over to Scott, who is going to give more information on the uh, managing these calls. 
Hello, everybody. I'm Scott Howard, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the uh, operations end of this. Um, now that we're able to take in thousands of calls at a time, the question is, how do you manage all that information? Uh, during my 29 years of service at Cochran MC, I've, I've had the chance to work many large storms, including hurricanes, many before we even had an IVR system. What I'm going to be talking about today is about how we managed all those calls with an IVR system, but before we had Future OMS, and how Future Future OMS has made it easier for us. All right, so how did Future OMS help us to cut the restoration time down by as much as a full day for this hurricane? Well, it was a lot of the little things. It came down to organizing the calls, which made for a more efficient use of field personnel, through the years, I've had the opportunity to see several changes. However, some things never seem to change. Some of the some of the crews would sometimes come in afterwards, and they'd always talk about how they seemed to crisscross each other during the night. Or some would even come in and say they rode all night, covered several counties, never put on the first lights because everywhere they went, someone else had already beat them there. That is a result of having to sort tickets by hand with an IVR system. Whenever you sort tickets by hand, you're gonna make mistakes. But future OMS, that doesn't happen anymore. That takes care of it for us. Before OMS, although we no longer had to answer every customer call, which was nice, the IVR system still produced paper tickets. And with the hurricane, it was a substantial amount of paper tickets that it had to sort. In the old days, we had to sort every one of those by hand, which meant there were a lot of mistakes made as far as the grouping the tickets together behind certain protection devices and stuff, which whenever you make mistakes in the sorting, that's, that means a, a longer restoration time in the, in the field. Future OMS takes the calls and puts each of the calls into a case. And how it works is OMS looks at the locations that are out it predicts an upstream device that's open and groups all the calls downstream from that device and puts them with that case. So whenever OMS predicts a particular case, a particular device, whether it's a recloser or a fuse or whatever, and a call comes in and says, I'm out, and, it's a, and it knows that it's behind a particular device, it's gonna automatically sort it with that case, done, we don't have to worry about it. OMS offers several different ways to organize, sort, and view your outage data. You know, you can sort by feeder size, outage, the size of the outage, the location, or the time that the calls came in. You can add special notes to attach to the case to help you with that. Cases can be updated from any workstation, which is a big help. You can view your entire utility or your own region can view outages from the cases tab or map tab or both, and employees in different areas or different offices can see what's happening elsewhere. And also with an AVL link, you can view the location of each vehicle. Okay, this is what the cases page looks like when all the calls come in and it sorts them to cases. This is what it looks like. Now keep in mind, when Hurricane Hermine came through, we had well over 300 cases. While the cases page displays many fields, we're only going to look at a few that we tend to look at and use the most during an outage. Note that these cases that were created is from test data and not an actual outage, um, but every case has an element name that is the device that is predicted to be out. Okay, that device is predicted to be out. Now, uh, when dispatching the crew to the location, we only have to give them that element name. Usually a fuse or recloser or something as a starting point. Before when we had OMS, we had to give them the location numbers of every consumer out of power that was in that area, which can be anywhere from a few consumers to 20, 30 or more. Then they had to look them up on the maps, look for the possible upstream device, and go to that and see if that's where it was. But being able to give them just the element name instead of a list of location numbers, does make dispatching the calls much easier and the crews are able to get to the affected device quicker than before. This next tab is 
number of customers out. It shows you how many customers are affected within each case, allowing you to dispatch crews to the locations with the larger numbers of consumers out first. Because what you normally like to do, you try to get the uh, largest number of consumers on as quick as you can. So you want to tend to head them to the largest case as possible. Okay. Okay, this is the memo field. This field is very helpful when working the outages, especially a large storm. The memo field is where we put the notes or anything important related to the case, such as broke poles. Before OMS, you know, such notes had to be handwritten and given to the operations manager running the outages. These tended to be hard to keep up with and was at times not put with the correct locations related to the note, which meant sometimes crews would be sent to an area without knowing what was ahead, such as broke poles and such as that. During Hermine, uh, spotters in the field would call us on our cell phones and report the damage. This could be anything from a wire down or broke poles or trees on the line. We would then, at a workstation in the back of the operations center, enter that information into the memo field of the appropriate case. For example, if it was broke poles, we would enter the number of poles that were broke, the size of the poles, the framing of the poles, plus if there's any transformers or any other devices that they needed while they was out there, secondary wires such as that. And as soon as that change was made in OMS, all the other workstations automatically refresh to show the update. So when the, when the operations manager dispatches a crew for that case, he already knows the problem, he knows what they need to take with them, and they will have what they need when they get there instead of getting there and realizing they need another pole, they got the wrong size transformer, the wrong voltage transformer, or whatever, which saves a lot of time having to go back in and get something or wait for somebody to bring you something. And knowing what the damage is ahead of time, you don't send it. Also helps with the efficiency of the crew. You don't wind up sending a two man crew to a location with broke poles that they're not equipped to work or waste resources by sending a full five-man crew to a span of wire down that two men can work. It costs valuable time when you have to relocate personnel to no new location because they can't, they're not equipped to do the job that uh, needs to be done at that particular location. Also knowing what is needed at each location ahead of time, the crews will already have everything they need with them when they get there, eliminating the need to come back in for more material. Well, okay, there we go. All right. The feeder tab is uh, sort by feeder. What you can do with this feeder is if you notice it, it's got Tifton 1, Moultrie 8, Moultrie 8, Tifton 1. They're all mixed up in order. You can sort them where they're all in order, and it it makes organizing everything a lot easier, because um, especially during Hurricane Hermine and other large storms, we tend to send a crew to a particular location or a particular feeder to work that feeder during the storm. And when they call in and say, okay, we've got this case back on, where do we need to go to next? And if they're working Tifton 1 and you've got all the Tifton 1s grouped together, you just simply look for the next one with the largest number of customers affected, give them that element number, boom, they're gone. You don't have to take time sorting through all those stacks of paper tickets and, and such as that. Okay. Oh, the, I don't have a slide for it, but if you look at the field to the left of feeder, it's region. And at Cochrane MC, and a lot of, this is especially beneficial for a lot of utilities that will work storms, storm restoration from different offices or different locations. At Cockwood MC, we have an office in Moultrie two, and two district offices, one in Valdosta Austin, one in Tifton that are all fully equipped. And during a large storm, such as uh, Hermine, each district works their own outages. The region tab allows you to only view the cases from your region, which really helps to clean up the cases page but one thing about the districts here are the districts are divided by such features as county lines, highways, and rivers, and such as that. However, our electrical feeders do not comply to these restrictions. In fact, we have several feeders that cross district boundaries. 
One example is half of our Berlin three feeder is in the Moultrie district and half is in the Tifton district. The region is nothing more than just a polygon feature in our GIS. And when we created the region, um, region layer, we kept all the feeders within one region. So when we uh, click on the region tab and each office is working their own office, um, all cases that come in for Berlin three feeder will come to the Moultrie case and Tifton will not see them. What that means is if Moultrie has somebody working on one end of Tifton of Berlin three, we don't have to worry if there's somebody from Tifton working on the other end of Berlin three, and we may throw in a device and heat up the line with somebody working down the line and we don't know about it. So that, that's a pretty good safety feature where that comes into. Oh, there's the region tab. Okay, it did show up. All right. Along with the cases page, you can also view the outages on the system maps. And me being a mapping person, this is the page I like to use the most. Um, this is test data. It's not actual outage data. But um, what we normally do is we detach the map from the cases page and drag it to the next monitor and view the maps and cases side by side. Uh, and with a link to AVL, um, where you'll be able to see the vehicles, this helps really helps in um, rerouting the crews to the nearest location without him and eliminating a lot of travel time. Okay, when the lights start coming back on, Futura OMS allows you to ping the meters. Before OMS, we had to call each consumer affected to consume their lights are back on. This was a lengthy process requiring several office personnel during which the crews, the crews would normally be sent to a new location while we're making those calls because it could take sometimes up to an hour or more to, uh, to make those calls. Many times after the crew had done left that location and went somewhere else, we would find out that there's still lights out in that area and we would have to later on that evening or the next day send somebody right back to that location um, where they just came from. With them, uh, with the multiple <clears throat> with the multiple ping options, Future OMS can quickly confirm power has been restored. One such option is they can ping just one meter behind each transformer. The theory behind that is if a meter behind one meter behind each transformer is on, then that transformer is hot and all the other meters should be on. And that really speeds up the, the pinging process. And this process usually takes just a few minutes which means you can keep the crew in that area while you ping. And while you're pinging, uh, you, you get a quick response if there's any, if there's still any out in that area, then you can send that crew to go and clean up those uh, few remaining outages while they're still in, the, in that area before they leave, <clears throat> which uh, turns out to be a pretty good uh, time saver. Okay, this shows the actual ping process. Um, I, this ping, I pinged 220 meters, and after about 30 seconds, I took a screenshot. The blue symbol is a meter that has been pinged as a ping request, but has not returned that request yet. The green symbol are meters that have responded and that they are back on. The whole ping for everything to get all 220 uh, calls back took less than a minute. Um, I, I could not tell you how long it would take to call 220 consumers, but it would take considerably longer than just a minute. And we're able to, like I said, keep the crew there, make sure they're all back on before we send them on their way. Also, any meter that responds back that is still out will come in red. And at that time, you can actually create a new case for that location while you clear out the original case and um, all the other consumers and get that cleaned up. The benefits of using future OMS is the improved organization of the outages, more efficient routing of the crews in the field, faster response time from pinging the meters, which that is a huge time saver. 
it takes fewer people to work and out work from the office during an outage and it cuts down overall outage time. Uh, we have noticed that fewer people, it takes fewer people to run the outages that, that used to take in the past, uh, mostly because with um, just an IVR with paper tickets, you spend a lot of time sorting tickets, resorting tickets. Uh, before you ping, a lot of people had a call, which was very time consuming. And with future OMS grouping everything within a case, and you know everything in that case is downstream and related to each other, it's a lot more efficient uh, for the crews in the field uh, as far as working the outages. And we'd like to thank you for your time. And if you have any questions or contacts, that is our email address. And please feel free to contact us and get to the questions. Yeah, thanks guys for your time. These are actual photos of us too, by the way. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we currently have... go go ahead, Jessica. Oh no, I have one quick question. I'm sorry, I neglected to unmute myself. I asked the question and I did not unmute myself. Um, <laughs> what uh, what was the total outage time from the first customer off to the last customer back on? Okay, well, we started getting some scattered stuff around the 28th. That was those widespread feeder bands. <clears throat> and those um, really are normal on-call personnel can handle. They were kind of intermittent and very scattered. But when the bulk of the storm hit uh, uh, on September the 2nd, I'd say by September 2nd and 3rd was the majority of it. By the 4th, it was just cleanup stuff. By the, the third day, it was just normally cleanup stuff. Hmm. So mostly it was just two full days, and then the third day was a lot of cleanup. All right, and I have a question from uh, Andrew. Uh, he's asking, how do your crews receive the information about each outage, and where are they when they receive this outage? Do you send okay. this to the truck? or yeah right right now uh we radio them in their trucks and they're in the trucks in the field when when uh, we give them the uh the information we are looking at going to uh, a field pro product with future which will enable us to actually send the outages to their tablet in the trucks okay. but right now uh, that... right now we just do it simply over, over the radio which is why being able to give them just that element name instead of a whole list of numbers is really beneficial. All right. So, um, how, you know, while the guys were doing the restoration work, how did you handle um, any as built or work orders that would need to be done during the actual restoration work or were those done afterwards? Yeah. Well, usually during the restoration, we try to, as much as we can, to go back exact or like it was before. And with the memo field that we now have, where when they tell us in the field what we need when we get out there, it makes it very easy to replace everything back with what, what was there to begin with, as far as the size pole, the framing, the size transform, and such as that. But if something comes up, where we need to make a change later on we just simply make a note of it and do a work order after the storm's done or through work and we go out and drop a work order and get it done that way but during during the restoration we we put it back as as was um this question from jason gross i believe uh, how did you handle hazards as it relates to like trees down wires down um you know did you send out multiple crews one to do tree trimming and then another to actually come back and do the restoration work or was it one crew that did everything no we had multiple crews and a lot of times if uh, like 911 centers or consumers will call in that there's a large tree uh, we would have a right-of-way crew to go out or far people called and said okay the problem is here we've got a huge oak tree on the line we would send a right-of-way crew out first to go ahead and get the trees off the line because they're more equipped and better at 
handling it, uh, getting trees cut off the lines that our crews are, uh, as far as wires down. Um, yeah, we put that in the, that's what goes in the memo fields. So as we're looking for places to send people to, we look for uh, critical information like that and we send them to those locations first, you know, because those can be hazardous. Okay, um, how, this one from Conrad, how often are your, is your information from GIS ported over to your OMS? So that the two stay in sync or do they run on the exact same data or is there a time delay for updating GIS data that's been transferred over to your LMS? Actually, I do an update every weekend. I do an export from uh, GIS and then do an imp import into the OMS every weekend. And that's just mm -hmm. for the daily use. But if we have something come up where we've just put in a new feeder or uh, added another circuit or, or change feeds in some way, then I can go ahead and do the uh, updates that evening. And then they'll be current as soon. And it usually takes about two hours to do the export and the update. I would imagine before a big storm that <clears throat> you went ahead and pushed out a new model before the new storm was coming, just to make oh, yeah. sure you have the most up-to-date system information possible. Yes. Uh, how long did it, uh, or what was the process and the time frame involved to get your LMS integrated into your overall information systems operation system? Mm -hmm. That would probably be a very good question for Futura. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it went, it, you know, of course, anytime you get any kind of new system, there's going to be some tweaking and stuff at the beginning. But actually, uh, it, w it went very well as far as integrating everything together. I mean, the fact that we use Futura Maps and Futura OMS, you know, they're going to mesh, they're going to blend together r rather well. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, well, with that, let I uh, say we go ahead and close out today's webinar. Uh, thank you both for being with us today and talking about your experiences during your post-hurricane restoration. Um, and I appreciate your willingness to, to go through this with us. And with that, this will conclude today's webinar. All thank right. you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. We'll be more than happy to answer anybody's questions uh, in depth if uh, you shoot us an email.